Good afternoon, everyone. So I, it, I heard that there's been some really great presentations going on, some great workshops. So I am excited to be here to talk to you about data science and telecom. And I know we started a little bit late, but I'm sure you got some great information from the prior sessions. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick. And give me a second to get my presentation going. All right, so I should be sharing my screen now. And unfortunately, I can't see. Um, yes, it does say that Crowd, Crowd, um, Crowdcast is sharing my screen. So I should be sharing. So the, uh, welcome to Data Science and Telecom. Data Science and Telecom is such an exciting topic. My name is Dr. Francis Boykin. I am a director of advanced analytics at AT&T and data has been my passion for years and years. I've been at AT&T for 17 years. And then prior to that, I was at several other telecoms. So I've always done telecom work since I came out of college. And most of it has been in either the engineering um, organization or marketing and lately in customer advocacy and customer experience. But I'm going to talk to you today about how we can use data science and telecom to uh, progress our business, to gain revenues, to gain customers. So in, in this first screen, I just want to quickly go over a couple of things. Um, rich data source. Telecom is such a rich data source. It's exciting that the amount of data that we can gather in telecom. And recently we've had many tools that have been set up to help us with the ability to translate that data into insights. So let's jump right into data science. So machine learning and data science. Machine learning is the science and art of programming computers so they can learn from data. And data science is the science which uses computer science, statistics and machine learning, visualization and human computer interactions to collect that data, clean it, integrate it, analyze it, visualize it so that we can interact with the data to create data products. So what you're going to see as I move through this presentation is a couple of opportunities that we have within telecommunications to make this all work, the machine learning and the data science. So let's talk about the data. So in 2011, <coughs> excuse me, the World Economic Forum uh, put out a little article and it said data is the new oil. And why did they say that? I mean, just looking at a couple of spots here, there's 123 million blogs, and this was in 2011. We don't even want to talk about what it is today. 247 billion emails. We can go beyond that because I, I feel like I get 247 billion a day in my own job. But then there's the DVDs, and um, you can tell this is from 2011 because what are we using today? We're building out uh, information and data out on Netflix, Hulu, other applications. Um, not so many people using DVDs, but there you go. This was 2011. But we have, in 2011, they suggested that we had five exabytes of data out there. And I'm sure that it is like quadrupled since then or more. So what is big data? So big data is, com is a computing noun that means extremely large data sets. And we can tell, especially in telecom, that we have such, such a rich, robust amount of data to work with. Um, you can build patterns with this data, associations. We can especially look at it in um, relative to human behavior and interactions. Much of IT investment is going towards managing and maintaining big data. And there are five V's of big data, volume, velocity, veracity, variety, and value. Um, looking at the raw data, the volume of the raw data, the amount of data that we bring to the table, um, and then looking at the velocity, how that data changes over time. A lot of what we look at in telecom is data sets 
over time. So we look at trend analysis. We want to look at over time, how are our customers reacting to our products and services? And in telecom, of course, we're talking about the, our mobile networks. But beyond that, especially for AT&T, what about the additional information around um, media, water media, the movies, the, the television shows? We had all of that, of course, especially with DirecTV in, in the mix as well. And then the variety of data, I talked about that a little bit. And then the veracity, how the data quality. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. But the big thing about um, veracity and understanding data quality is if your organization is anything like my organization and the other organizations I've been a part of, veracity is an issue. Data quality is always an issue. Um, that's why we have data munging, cleaning that data and getting it and prepping it so that we can use it to build insights. And then um, the value of that data. Is that data valuable for information regarding decision making? Can we make decisions based on, on this data or is it extraneous data that we may not need? And as we build out models and look at building out insights, one of the things we want to do is feature analysis so that we can ensure that we have the right pieces of information for the models and, and information that we're working with. So that's that's big data. And it's a big deal. So what are some of the core computational methods that we use in big data? Um, aggregations, GNPs, graphical models, linear al algebra, and optimization. Though, and if you look at this slide, and this is one of my favorite slides, um, I put this together for a team that I was working with and I was building their knowledge around data science. And one of the things that I was able to do is um, categorize the different kinds of methods and then include the different categories outside of those methods and color code them. And they found this very helpful. But querying the data, <clears throat> looking at nearest neighbor and some of the other um, ways that we look at the data, um, density est estimation, um, regression, linear regression, kernel regression. We all do that. It's a big thing that we do. Classification, nearest neighbor goes in there, classifier, um, um, support vector machines, dimension reduction, principal component analysis. That's huge. How do we get those features that we need in our models? We've got to do some PCA to, to get it down to a reasonable amount of data. Outlier detection, Clustering, we all, k-means, um, we do that a lot. Um, time series analysis, feature selection and causality, and then two sample testing and matching. Those are all ways that we, and algorithms and, and methods, computational methods that we use when we're working with our data on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm gonna move on and, and talk about that analytics journey. Um, one of the things that I worked with, especially the team that I was working with, they were used to hindsight reporting and oversight. They were used to dashboards and alerts. Mostly, though, they looked at BI tools and used those for hindsight reporting. And as you can see from this particular chart, my favorite, one of my favorite charts, because it shows the business benefit on one side and the time that it takes to implement on the bottom on that x-axis. So what does that mean? That means as you go up in your journey towards predictive analytics, it's going to give you more business benefit, but it's also going to take more time to implement. So it's pretty easy to buy a BI tool, put some data underneath it and start showing some things. Over, uh, building into oversight where you have some dashboards and some alerting, adding the alerts to let you know, okay, yeah, we're not just looking in the past. Let's tell you a little bit about what happened in the past. And then insight, OLAP, data mining, building out that additional um, information, and then moving into predictive analytics, which is where, of course, I don't know about you, but that's where I like to live. There's a little bit a, a one step further, you can go to prescriptive analytics. I will tell you that that's one of the hardest places to get to. Most of the companies that I have been around haven't been able to get there. And mostly it's because we you need a set specific skill set. And one of those skill sets is understanding behavior um, and behavior modification for individuals and consumers. Uh, looking at their, their emotions as, as they make choices regarding products and services. So that's when you get to the prescriptive. So that's looking a little bit, that's looking into the future. 
Whereas predictive gives you foresight, that prescriptive is going to take you a little bit further. How do I look and then kind of get ahead of whatever is going on so that I can make my um, kind of steer my customers or clients into the avenue that I want them to be in? So that's that's the journey for um, analytics, for getting from hindsight reporting and BI tools all the way up to modeling and building out that predictive analytics piece. So use cases and challenges in telecommunications and big data. So how do we use it in telecom? I'm going to get into a specific use case in a bit, but what I, what I want to do is in the next couple of slides, show you how you can categorize um, data, big, using big data in telecom. And a lot of organizations, they look at it in three ways, customer, service, and resource. And they kind of group the big data in that way. So product recommendation, we've seen that, that's big. Look at Amazon, that is big. So putting that data and infrastructure behind your you know, interface to the company to help you determine what are the best products that you might want from that organization. And let's face it, upsell as well, gets you to buy more stuff. Data monetization. So you can gather all this data, you can anonymize it. And then if your customers accept the, the uh, uh, information, accept it, you can sell that data to other organizations that might use that data to sell additional products and services. And, you know, you'll get that little privacy notice and that privacy notice will say, hey, are you OK with us selling your information to other organizations? So that's the service piece. And this is all under infrastructure and products. And then this last piece under infrastructure and products is network planning and capacity planning. I'm going to talk a little bit more about these. These are kind of my ballywick. I've done some of the data monetization and some of the product recommendation, but the big piece that I kind of like was my, has been my bread and butter is helping out with the network planning. So in telecom, of course, you've got those towers. How do I build out my plan around where I put place my next tower? Part of it can be where there's no tower and you want to get into that space, but you can also do some great um, modeling around who are the people who are your current customers who are in that area? What are the issues they're facing? Are they having network issues? And if I do want to build out in that particular area, how many people am I going to impact? What is the the benefit to my customers. So that's network planning. And I've seen some of that done. Capacity planning, how much of something I need. Um, I've seen that specifically in global supply chain, <clears throat> excuse me, ensuring that I had enough of products in our retail stores, have the right product at the right place. I'm gonna talk about that. I have a use case that I'm gonna show you on that. And then in the operations, um, believe it or not, I guess at my 17 years at at and I've been on both sides of this. I've been on the infrastructure and product side. I've also been on the operation sides, building out the, the, the churn and the anal analysis and prediction. Um, churn is big, especially in telecom. How many, most of us have at least two cell phones, but how many cell phones do you really need? And so building out the ability to keep that moving, keep your customers. There's lots of, of competition out there, especially amongst telecoms. And you want to be able to keep your customers and understand how your customers are feeling about you <clears throat> so that if they're in danger of churning, then you might want to build in some um, initiatives to help kind of circumvent that. Mm, excuse me. I think I need to take a quick drink of water. But that's churn analysis and prediction. Okay. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so proactive customer care. Um, I'm Right now, I'm in customer advocacy, and I was in customer experience for a while. So being proactive and ensuring that, hey, what's the friction that I'm seeing? Building out the models that help you say, hey, if I look at these features and these features regarding my customers, I'm going to see something that indicates to me that they need some additional care or some of our processes and procedures aren't working the way that we think that they should work. That's all under the customer um, avenue there. So moving down to service, 
fraud management, ordering process optimization. I'll admit that I haven't done a, a lot of this, but I have supplied the data to our organizations who manage fraud as well as the ordering process and optimization. Um, a, one project project that I was involved in was especially during COVID. So at the beginning of COVID, there were a lot of companies that had shortages. Well, telecom was impacted by that as well. So the widgets that we use to build out the products that we sell, i.e. phones and other things, um, weren't available. So the supply chain organization that um, manages ordering process and op optimization, the planning team, they had to create a model to help them determine, okay, I only have X amount of day of supplies and I have this many orders to fill. How do I manage and put those supplies to the best use until we get more supplies? That was a huge project and it was awesome project. I had a friend who led that project up and it was such, it was so interesting to see how he took the machine learning that we had been doing and applied it to that, that um, issue. So fault management and root cause analysis. Um, I will tell you, I haven't done much with fault management, but on root cause analysis, we have definitely done a lot of work, even in customer experience to look at the root cause of the issues that our customers are facing. So all of that, not only does it, we have a lot of data to work with, but we have a lot of opportunity with AI and machine learning to help us hone in on these particular areas within infrastructure and products, as well as operations to make changes um, and better serve our customers, whether they're internal customers or external customers. So I'm going to move on because I want to talk about this a little bit more. So this particular slide right here, it's similar. There are some similar things here, but I wanted to talk to you specifically about not only um, the customer, the, the, the three paths that I showed before, but looking at it a little bit deeper, like customer loyalty, acquisition and retention. We talked about churn already, um, but I want to talk about customer loyalty, acquisition and retention with you, and then talk a little bit about the data-driven improvement of network services. I talked previously a little bit about network and how we, we definitely want to be able to see which which places our network is going to, is needed most, what changes we need to make in those areas, and then security under fraud detection and pre prevention and some other things there. So under customer loyalty, acquisition and retention, this happens to be my favorite place to, to talk. Um, I did my dissertation on customer loyalty. So of course it's, it's one of my favorite topics. So beyond customer churn analysis, there's sentiment analysis. How do your customers feel about you? Going out and scraping that data off the internet, off of social media, pulling that data back in, and then adding your operational metrics to it so that you can dig deeper. Clickstream, let's understand what the, our customers are doing, not only on our websites, but on other websites, and how that can be used then to determine, let's say I go out to the web and I'm able to um, you know, develop a project. That project says, I, I bring in data from my customers and what they're doing on the net. I don't know that, that this is an actual project, but let's say we could do that. I could then take that information and say, hey, this is what my customers are doing at different places on the net. This might lead me to believe that we need products and services in this area, or we need to optimize our products and services in another area. So that's how you can use clickstream data. And then, of course, targeted marketing, customer segmentation, profiling our customers, and then providing the right recommendations. I used to be in marketing. I was in marketing for 11 years, and targeted marketing, marketing was always a big discussion. So how do we send the right communications to the right customers at the right time? So that they then say, hey, I, I want to buy that uh, because there is a there is a sweet spot that you need to hit between the how your customers feel about you, what they're out there looking for and what we now have to offer. You have to find that that right mix and then get to your customers so that you can then sell more products and services and then optimized plans. 
So that's all under customer loyalty, acquisition and retention. Awesome, awesome stuff there. And then moving on to data-driven improvements of network services. I mentioned one example of that, um, real-time call detail um, analysis. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I have not seen that happen. I would love to see that happen. Call detail records are huge. They are just amazingly big. Now, I will say there are some great applications out there that are um, available and wonderful ways that we can now pull in a lot of real-time data and then build out analysis around that. One of the organizations that I've just recently been um, privy to is Thunderhead. I had never seen real-time analysis of customers and their journeys and where what they're doing um, within an organization until I saw this and this what Thunderhead could do. So really great things there. Capacity optimization, demand forecasting. Again, my friend who had the um, the project around um, supplies, he that he does demand forecasting. So lots of great things there. And then failure prediction. I've seen this and I've heard about this being done, especially in field um, field equipment. That failure detection and anomaly detection. I have not done any work with it specifically myself. But I will tell you that I have seen this, this, I've heard about this even in my own organization. And I do want to break here just for a second and mention that there, it is storming really bad here. So hopefully that won't impact me, but uh, we'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, it's looking pretty bad. So uh, just I'm here in Atlanta, so I'm not sure whether this is going to be a quick storm or a fast uh, or a slow storm, but it is storming pretty bad here. So moving right along with our fingers crossed on the storm. So optimized plans, again, falls into this area. GIS um, location deta um, data monetization. I will tell you, I actually was part of a really cool pro um, project, a network project, and it included this really cool application of being able to look at our cell, our, our proposed or planned uh, tower locations, and then the customers in that location and how we might best serve our customers. So moving on to security, fraud detection and prevention, um, anomaly detection, fault, uh, false answer and long, long call detection, unauthorized devices. Of course, in telecom, this is important. It's especially important in ensuring that we um, prevent um, fraud with our, our devices. So we have definitely seen that in, at at and I'm sure every organization, telecom has seen that as well, where you have people who just are going to game the system. And um, the only way to, to combat that in most cases is to build out ways to alert and understand when that might happen and also use machine learning to help say, hey, these these when people de do these types of things, it's leading towards fraud or stealing or whatever that might be. Payment pro fraud and payment processing, um, data protection and compliance. So those are all great places that we see for um, use of big data in telecom. So hopefully that's helpful for you. So let me talk a little bit about how you build out those data science and, um, and development projects. So how do I build out a project? So I've got all my data. I know which area I want to focus in on. So what are my next steps? So there are, I, I love this slide um, and I have the, the place where I got this slide um, listed down here, but this is one of my favorite slides. One of the reasons it's one of my favorite slides is um, the business understanding is the very first thing on this wheel. And what I can tell you is that many, many times data science projects and any and projects in general will go bad because of lack of business understanding. So Understanding the business is definitely something that has to be a part of the equation. I don't know about you, but I've had I've been on projects where we brought an outside entity in. They're here to help us with the project. And what we found is that, hey, it was tough getting them getting this project done because we spent had to spend a lot of time doing what? Getting them to the business understanding, because you have to have that before you can move on with the project. And then data mining getting into the gold of the data. 
bringing it out so that you can then use it. And the what takes, I think, the biggest chunk of time is cleaning that data, making that data valuable so that you can now use it, and then exploring the data, moving through the data, exploring what it can do, building out all of the, the anomalies, um, looking at that, looking at whether you have all the bits and pieces that you need, and then doing the feature engineering, determining which specific constructs you need that are valuable for the question you're trying to answer or the problem you're trying to solve. And then of course, once you've done all of that and you'll notice that one, two, three, four, and five all have to happen before you can ever get to that predictive modeling, the fun stuff, right? So before you can get to the fun stuff, you've got to, you know, schlep through the the business understanding, the data mining, the data cleaning, the data exploration, and the feature engineering. So you've got to slog through all of that and work through it till you can get to everything in a what in a place where now I can do the predictive modeling. And then I tell people this, and this actually was my Achilles heel. I was not good at data visualization. I had to get there because all the predictive modeling in the world isn't going to mean anything if you can't build something that somebody can in leadership can look at and then act upon. So six and seven, um, I know six is our fun sweet spot, but seven is so, so very important. And if I had to go through, I would say um, it's so funny that number one and number seven are probably the most important pieces if you're going to have a successful project because you can iterate over two to six forever. You can just iterate, iterate, iterate. But if you don't get number one and you don't get number seven, I don't know that your project goes very far. So just my personal opinion on that one. So moving on. And I apologize that I can't see the chats. So if you are chatting, I'm not able to um, see that. I will try to take a look after I finish the presentation at some of the chats and see if I can answer questions that have come up along the way. So let's talk about a use case. I told you that I had a use case um, and my use case is in global supply chain. Um, I spent three years in global supply chain. It was an awesome opportunity to learn so much about the organization. And I thought I came from 11 years working in marketing and thought we were, you know, just happy go lucky with all our data until I got over to global supply chain and realized, oh my gosh, I've never seen so much data in my life. So global supply chain is a rich, rich source of information and data. So what are some of the things that you can do and look and what are the impacts that you can can? What are the areas that you can impact within global supply chain? Some of the uh, areas that I was privy to were inventory planning warehouse logistics, and then device distribution. So those are three areas that are very rich in data and also very, very rich in complex, uh, in complex issues. So how does supply chain analytics work? Um, I talked a little bit about this already. Descriptive analytics, predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics, cognitive anal analytics, which is, uh, I didn't talk about that before, but Descriptive analytics, that's that first step. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. That's that first step. Before you do anything, doing this descriptive analytics is going to help you understand the data that you have. It's going to understand what whether you have holes in your data, whether the data is the uh, the breadth that you think it's going to be, whether it includes all the timing that you need. And then you can move into your um Diagnostic, so diagnostic, then descriptive analytics, and then move to your predictive analytics. So I think if we go back to that slide where I showed you this slide here, um, I'm not able to do it that way, so we'll just pop on back. You know, here we go. So we have the descriptive, then the diagnostic, then the prescriptive. So the descriptive is that very first where we start looking at the data that we have and then going into diagnostic. So moving um, back here. So we the descriptive here, the predictive here. So that predictive analytics is really where we want to get to. That's where you can help that your organization understand the most likely outcomes or future scenarios and what the implication of those outcomes are for business. Um, 
we can look at um, how to mitigate and disruptions and risks just by doing predictive analytics. And we all know in telecom, those risks are churn. Everybody's talking about churn. How do I make sure that my customers don't leave me? So that that is important there. So what are the importance in, uh, of supply chain analytics? Gaining a significant return on investment. Um, building out better uh, and a better understanding of your risks, increasing the accuracy of planning. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more and then achieving a lean supply chain, only having what you need and pushing what you need where you need it and then preparing for the future. That's the big thing. And whether it's supply chain or marketing or customer experience, you're preparing for the future for whatever your your focus is in customer experience. It's preparing to be able to um, make advances in or changes in how we supply and service our customers and in marketing it's to better prepare for how we touch our customers and market to our customers so all the same thing just you can move uh, take out the word supply chain and put anything you want in there marketing um, customer experience whatever networking anything that you want and it will do the same thing um, in this particular case, though, a recent Gartner survey re revealed that 29% of survey organizations said that they have achieved high levels of ROI by using analytics compared with only 4% that achieved no ROI. But the important thing to understand is that return on investment, um, you have to be investing in the right things to get good investments right and get good returns and once you and using analytics can help you focus on the right things so honing in on the right things and then pushing forward from there whoops so our goal in this particular use case was to improve um, inventory planning um, performance through predictive data um, driven insights so First of all, we wanted to identify the data triggers that can be used to plan individual store device inventory needs. We wanted to build out a model to be used in inventory planning process to provide guidance on which devices are most likely to be purchased at which stores. And then we wanted to develop an analytical working environment with structured and unstructured data for our supply chain folks to be able to use ongoing. And so um, in this particular case, um, in this diagram, you'll see we start at the retail stores and then we brought in our big data, who, the demographics, what, when, their purchase history and their campaign history and where store, and where the store profiles. And then we fed that, fed that in to inventory planning, warehouse logistics and device distribution back to the retail stores. And this, of course, was where we did our modeling or wanted to do our modeling. OK, so. What are the five phases, um, project phases that we wanted to, that we do in building out these models and building out data science projects within our organizations? There is one um, plan, build your predictive analytics hypothesis. Uh, don't just jump in willy nilly, <laughs> plan it out, then build out your, your um, data analysis, identify those data triggers, that's the discovery feature analysis, do all of that. And then we had to build out our, in our case, we built out a data environment. We had to develop an analytical working environment. And in that environment, we placed all that data and we did additional um, uh, analytics on that data, okay? Uh, we built a model, we ended identified the devices most likely to be purchased at which stores, and then we integrated that model. We piloted that model in specific areas and integrated the model into our current procedures. So that were what those were the five phases that we worked through this particular project. So I've already talked to you about big data. Um, you just know you got to have a lot of data for these models. Um, if you've worked in in analytics at all, you know, the more data, the more good data you have, the better your projects are. So it's definitely important that you have good, good data. So there you go. You gather and prep the data to make accurate predictions. So identifying data that supports inventory and sales interactions was our goal. We, again, we went and got the who, the what, the when, the why, and the where. And then in this particular case, we used Teradata Aster. 
So we use the, uh, that as our big data environment. You know that there are so many big data environments out there now. There, there's cloud um, opportunities, Palantir. Uh, what are some of the other great ones that we've, I've seen recently? Um, you've got Palantir, you've got Snowflake, um, you can slap Databricks on that. You can, um, what else, uh, Vertica, um, lots of great opportunities there. So lots of big data environments. Uh, we just happen to be using Aster. So, so you know what? Uh, take another drink real quick. Okay, building profiles to predict future purchase behavior. So as I mentioned before, um, we we look to build out the customer information. We profiled our customers. Um, built out a group, uh, group customers um, by demographics, excuse me. Um, we built out our stores, our store information. We pulled that in. We created a relationship between our customers, our purchases, our stores. And then we built out the results to help determine the probability of device purchases in a particular store. So that's what we were doing there. And purchases, promotions, store traffic, all of that was, was used. And then what did you know a lot of people say okay well what were you using um so to build our model we use collaborative filtering so we use a recommendation engine um to help us with that excuse me just a second right. so we use the um uh take another drink real quick so Building out that model, we used a collaborative filtering model. Let's see if that'll help with my little cough or whatever. So building out the model, um, we looked at collaborative filtering. We used a recommendation engine. Um, here it this I built this actual slide out to help when I was presenting on how we were using the collaborative filtering um, engine. So of course you have three, we, I broke it down into the three pieces. There was the input, um, the active input that we provided, and then the, the algorithm itself um, and how it uses a cultural di distance matrix um, for calculating the similar and a calculating similarity matrix to build out um, the, uh, help help to predict the mis missing values and build out our output that we got from the collaborative filtering on Aster. It was a really, really, really great opportunity to use a piece of technology or piece of analytics um, a tool on Teradata. I really liked it. It was extremely easy. So this looks a little bit complex, but the really cool thing about all of it is that you don't have to know how it works because Teradata in this instance had a had a nice uh, like two line piece of code that we used um, to actually build this out. And it would spit out the output for us into a table, which is was really awesome. And so it made it really easy for us to work through this project and it made it easy for us to build out the models that we needed long term. Whoops a little bit back. So how did we use it? So what we ended up doing is we ended up taking the that algorithm, the output from that algorithm, and um, and it, what it gave us, it gave us a store location, it gave us the recommendation for what products and services. And you know, this is a little old, because we are certainly not using the iPhone sixes anymore. But in, in this particular case, what we wanted to know is we wanted to know, hey, so uh, what products and products should we have? And and that collaborative filtering model also not only told us what products we should have in the store, it actually told us the combination of products that best sell together. And there was a, a, another piece on there that showed us where in the store we should actually place those um, um, items. So kind of like what you see when you go to the grocery store, where you go to the grocery store and you have, I don't know, I'm guessing because I don't normally buy beer, but let's say you have beer and chips near each other, because guess what? Beer and chips go together. So that's the kind of thing that, that we were able to build out of this model. But the interesting thing that it showed us is that it showed us that even though two stores might be very close to each other, they might read differently. And that's what I was trying to 
express to our leadership. I was trying to express to our leadership that, hey, what you have to understand is the peanut butter spread way of delivering products to stores. It allows you to put stores uh, products in stores, but from a supply chain perspective, that's not the best way to go about it because you have what's called stranded inventory. Anybody who's been in supply chain knows you don't want stranded inventory. And that's inventory that's at the store that you can't sell at that store. Ultimately, you either have to send it to another store that needs it, but or you end up having to um, discount it and sell it at a, a huge discount. Or sometimes, in all honesty, it ends up left in a drawer someplace and, and you never sell it. And of course, that um, hurts the store, the store revenues. So that's how that's what we found there. So how did we test this model? So let me talk about how we tested it. So in the in this particular instance, I took a plan. I built a plan on all stores, all states. I had specific purchases at different locations happen. And then I re reviewed those results for accuracy of predictions. Um, the really cool thing was the purchases that were done at the different locations, and we actually um, piloted this at three different locations, and we picked three locations that one we, we felt like would follow the model, one that we knew would not follow the model or we had expectation because of the products and services that were sold in that area. And then a third one that was up in the air. And we wanted to make a, uh, a review of that. And what we found is that our results were very accurate. And um, we were also able to build out an algorithm and not an algorithm, but a calculation to show us how much money we were going to save based on that ac um, accuracy. So we were able to say if we had followed the model, we would we would have gained X amount of revenue based on the opportunity to have sold these items if we had had them available in that location. So it was a great opportunity to show not only how our models could work, but how we could actually leverage it in two ways, not just to say let's have the right product in the right place but flip that also around. What happens if you don't have the um, product in the right place? So what can we sell by having it in the right place? And what's our lost opportunity by not having a particular product, product in, a, in, um, in a location? So great opportunity to show the flip side there. So what did that mean? After we implemented the, the model, um, I actually was part of the, uh, well, I was the person building out the model. I handed that off to our um, our organization that we call it chief data office. They actually implemented it um, across the entire global supply chain. And where did we see the benefits replenishment? That replenishment strategy, optimizing how we replenish the store and make sure that we have the right products at the right store, support sales. So now when a customer comes in, they're more likely to find the right product there because we have shipped out the right products to the right places. And then inventory costs. Again, can't talk enough about stranded inventory. Don't want inventory sitting in our warehouses. Don't want inventory sitting in our stores. So that's how this all kind of coalesce to be a, a benefit all around in that way. So that concludes Yes, I see people are saying the storm is crazy. Sorry, you can hear that. But that concludes the, the presentation. But what I'd like to do is answer some questions. We have a few more minutes. I'd love to answer some questions um, if, if there are questions out there. Um, so far, I don't see any. I'm not sure if there's a moderator on. Whew, lightning. So demand forecasting. So, um, so oh, hey, Victor. So, so demand forecasting. This was an area that I actually worked on. So part of the project that I did as I was building out um, that original project that I just mentioned, one of the things, um, let me see if I can. So one of the things that I did there 
is I worked with a team that was doing the demand forecasting. And what they wanted to be able to do is they wanted to be able to look forward um, for two reasons. Number one, they be, wanted to make sure that their uh, estimates, their forecasting was accurate, but they also wanted to then start looking at, hey, well, I don't want to just look at one widget at, at a time. I want to be able to look across widgets. And here was the really cool thing about that particular project. So the guy that I was working with, one of the things that he realized, he said, look, we have issues where I might have widget A and widget A is, is part of 20,000 other products. So let's say, or orders. So, or orders. So what, what, um, what might happen is I want to understand really truly how much of this widget I really need. And I was like, but don't you know that? And they were like, he was like, not over time. I know overall, but not over time. I don't know when's the right time that I need this widget because one order may need maybe have two pieces in it and need one widget A. Another order might have 10 pieces in it and need five widget A's and on and on and on. And those products may need, those orders may need to be delivered at different intervals and different times. And I, I was like, oh my, that's like juggling balls. How do you know which is which? Um, uh, yes, timing is critical on demand forecasting. Thank you, Victor. Woo, lightning here. So. Uh, definitely have to go out and look through lots and lots of data. And he had actually been doing it manually using Microsoft Access for small amounts of data. But when we built out this project, he was able to pull that data into Aster, the Aster environment, a big data environment. And then he was able to crunch in minutes the entirety of his data set, hundreds of thousands of roles, rows across time and build out this wonderful dashboard that he was then able to present to leadership. And that was three years ago and they are still using it today. And, and my understanding is the only thing that they have av available to them in that manner. And of course they have the traditional supply chain um, demand for forecasting tools, don't get me wrong, but those tools didn't allow the flexibility of, of looking at the data in the way that he needed to look at it. And, the big data tools that we and projects that we were working on allowed him to do that. Any other questions? So I think we do have um, a few more minutes available. So I will stay. Um, this is that concludes everything that I had for you. If you don't have any questions, but I will tell you. I will still be here. I will be here, I think, until 4.30. Um, and if you need anything, just ping me. I will watch the, the chat room here. And if anyone has any questions, I'll answer you there. Thank you so much. And hopefully this has been um, an opportunity for you to learn a bit more about data science. And um, I hope it was valuable. <laughs>